we are all connected. So join me as I talk to like-minded people about topics that are appropriate to the current times we are living in. My name is Lerato Shabalala and this is Relevant. Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Relevant with me, Lerato Shabalala. Remember that you can get the podcast on my website, liratoshabala.com, or you can go to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever else you listen to podcasts for the audio version of this. But if you want to see me and my guest today, remember, just go to my YouTube uh, channel to watch the full um, show and see our gorgeousness. Okay, we're black girls, we're beautiful, we're serving, so you must watch us. I want to say I'm so excited to speak to my guest today. Luckily for me, it's not the first time I'm talking to her. I spoke to her and interviewed her at a different station a while back. Like me, she's Miss Social Justice. Uh, <laughs> we are the Social Justice Girl. People need to give us t-shirts, actually, mm-hmm. that say <laughs> Social Justice Girl. I have the amazing um, diversity, you call yourself a diversity advocate, Tando. Um, You Mm -hmm. are also a former lawyer um, and you most incredibly are a model. Please help me welcome Tando. Hi, Tando. Hello, everybody. Hello, Lerata. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. You look incredible. There's so much we have to talk about. We have to talk about uh, beauty. We have to talk about the fashion industry. We have to talk about diversity and inclusion. We have to, there's so Mm. many things we have to talk Mm. about. But I I first Mm. wanted to Mm. start with, um, when I was reading up um, on you and your story is amazing. I mean, you've been voted as one of the 100 most influential uh, women by the BBC been on the cover of Vogue Portugal last year in 2019 you were part of the Pirelli calendar I mean I could count your accolades there's so many but when I was reading your story one of the things I found interesting is that you said you wanted to act and yes your father wanted you to be an accountant and then you said that the <laughs> middle ground yes. was being a lawyer it was law I was like, Tando, how is that a middle class? Yes. How did you, <laughs> I was like acting, accounting. How did you choose law <laughs> as a middle class? <laughs> I think, you know, um, f- from the get-go, law was uh, somewhat, it's a storytelling avenue. Um, because when you are representing people, you're carrying their stories through these vehicles. So it just... I mean, but also at that time, to be quite honest with you, I had a very um, elementary understanding of law. You know, I just, I saw people in law and order and in television and I thought, I can do this. (laughs) (laughs) I can do this. Meanwhile, you go to South African courts and we're in robes and it's nothing like what you see on television. but I mean, I was like 16. <laughs> so, so my understanding of what I was going into um, was, I didn't really have um, references, to be quite honest. Mm. And um, it, which is actually quite funny because I mean, my, my father is an engineer, my mother a filmmaker, but I think this is the thing with regards to black people is a lot of us are first generation something. Yes. Um, and even our parents were first generation something. So our references are a bit limited. You know, you go to law school on second year and you hear people talk about, oh, I'm going to VAC work or, oh, I'm going to my um, parents' firm or my father's uh, friend's firm. And you're just like, huh? <laughs> you know, <laughs> exactly. in your own circle, you, those references are not, are not there so I didn't really know what I was going into to be quite honest with you but I knew accounting accounting was not it um I I, like I survived maths (laughs) metric so I was like I'm like please don't put me through this anymore but I will always appreciate my father to be honest he made me take maths and science to up to metric I, I I struggled got beaten the whole way through but um, still managed to come out on higher grade math and higher grade science on, right. on quite, I'd say, decent grades. But it gave me, um, 
it, it was a stepping stone. You know, I could, mm. I had options. I could have, um, I could make the choice. I could say, I don't want to do accounting as opposed to I can't do accounting, you know? Um, so it was, yeah, parents make some difficult decisions and we appreciate them much later. And we really do, for those of us who choose careers that are not quite the straight line, it's, it's something that mm. we really, really appreciate. So then when you decide to be a prosecutor, you, cause mm -hmm. I also considered law. Uh, I was telling um, my other guests the, the week before that I considered law. And then I realized you'd have to defend people who actually committed the crime. You would just have to, and then I was like, hey, okay, maybe it's not mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. So when you decided mm -hmm. to be a prosecutor, you made a conscious decision to work with uh, victims of uh, uh, sexual abuse as well as uh, gender-based violence, which as you know, during this COVID-19 time, GBV cases have risen by 40%. And mm. I cannot imagine that that was an easy thing for you to go through as a human being to listen mm. to people's stories. Why did you decide that? Why weren't you an entertainment lawyer? Why, you know what I mean? Why, why was it important for you to uh, be there for um, such traumatized uh, people that needed probably your help more than anyone? You know, I think when I, when I went into about third year law, I, I did something called street law, uh, which was a, a volunteering program. And I think I was still, I suppose, finding my place in, in my understanding and my feeling of who I want to be as a person, mm -hmm. uh, professionally too. And you have all of these ideas, you know, there's the big five firms, there's, all, there's a whole host of things that are coming at you. And I did street law and I was volunteering. And then I decided, you know what, I'm going to take um, street law for my final year, which was, it, it wasn't really a very popular course um, because, you know, everybody was being drilled into going into corporate commercial. What and I was just law? like, I love, Can sorry. So street law is actually when you go out and you go into communities and you teach them the law. Oh. So you go into, um, whether it's underprivileged communities, whether you go into um, prisons, hospitals, you know. And I was like, and I remember what made me actually make this decision is a really strange, it's actually completely at, at, at loggerheads with what I chose <laughs> eventually. Because I went and I was speaking to, I went to a minimum sentence prison and I was speaking to these young men who had done crimes that were obviously horrific because they are in minimum sentence prison. And I was teaching them just, you know, to understand criminal law. Um, you know, I actually don't even remember why we were teaching them criminal law, but we were taking there to <laughs> teach them criminal law. Yeah. And, and some of them were studying and all of that. And it was the strangest of things that, I couldn't even ask them what they did because at that point in time, they were just, they were not, you know, these monsters that I would have read about. They were just young. A lot of them were young. They were young people who were about my age, who I was teaching. And, and I left there. And I remember even a friend of mine was like, do you even want to know what they did? And I said, I, I don't think no. I can actually handle that right now. But after some time I was sitting there and I thought to myself, I'm like, you know, I want to make my community better. Um, there's, there's something about being able to share knowledge to help people just navigate their world better that just resonated with me. Mm. I didn't even know what a prosecutor was in second year. I only found out what it was like, I think in third year. Sure, I learned it, but I didn't really understand it. And in third year, I really got to understand what the nature of the institution was. And I thought, I'd rather be on that side of things. I'd rather be on the side of things where, and again, even when I went into prosecution, highly underestimated the power of prosecution. Like, you know, people talk about the police, people talk about um, the, magistrate. the magistrate, but they don't talk about the prosecutor who actually decides, do I charge you? Do I not? Do I take you for diversion? Do I not? Does this case get to court yeah. or does it not? You know? Um, you can, I actually feel like prosecu prosecutors should be given far more power than they have because they can decide that, listen, instead of me, instead of you going to court as an 18 year old who stole stuff, um, at a shop, 
I can rather take you for community service where you can be better, you know, and then you don't have a criminal record. You can still be economically mobile. Um, but, you know, yeah, anyway, point is, I just thought that would be, that would be the place I'd rather practice my skill. And what was that like? I know you eventually left it after a couple of years and you, you also worked for the NPA. So what was it like being um, a prosecutor, particularly of such intense? Because one of the things when I was looking at your uh, previous inter interviews, one of the things you said was not only are prosecutors more important, as you say, because they determine the, the sentence or whatever it is that they require you to serve, but also that you then realize how many women, how women get doubted. Why didn't you scream? Uh, why were you wearing this? Had you been drinking? And that was very sobering for me to actually think mm. of you as a prosecutor having to, as a woman, mm. also, and as a black woman, and you know, we're at the bottom of the pyramid mm. when it comes to people who are important in the world. And just to, mm hear those cases day in and day out. What was that like for you? Uh, disillusioning. <laughs> um, I think it was disillusioning because I think we have a very romantic understanding of what the law is and what it'll do. Um, and, and also what people are, you know, um, we, 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 we don't kind of see things in gray areas. Um, and I'll give you an example, completely removed from um, sexual offenses because that is, uh, uh, that, that I did later when I got to the regional court. I remember there was a court case where I had a victim who, cause I can't tell you a lot of detail, but I had a victim who got really badly injured through a car accident and a woman who, I was about to prosecute and she was you know maybe in you know she was quite old um and and she was devastated she kept saying i am so sorry she saw this man who she had injured badly and she just cried and cried and that case no, who's the bad guy yeah. you know um yeah. it's, it, it just it, it's not it's not as as black and white as this is this person is evil and that person is good um not always sometimes you have very clear cases of predatory behavior and you know a person who was completely victimized by it but sometimes areas are gray and i think and also you know sometimes you have situations where you don't have very forthcoming victims or whatever the case may be and it just teaches you a lot about human nature that's one thing but also the second thing is that when I said disillusioning is that you always think that this, these systems are just supposed to work. Yep. You know, people are supposed to go to police stations, be police are supposed to be receptive. We're, the, then the victims are supposed to come to us. We're supposed to help them, provide them with the service. Then they're supposed to go through, go to the, go to court, get justice. justice. And, and things just, yeah. things don't work that way for many, many reasons. So that's why I said it was a bit disillusioning. Um, yeah, that makes and sense. I think, yeah, I think, so. yeah, that makes total sense. I, I think, that, <laughs> I think there are many professions that, that are like that. I think journalism is one of them. You know, I got into mm. a particular idea of mm. to show different kinds of beauty and different people. Then I was mm. told black uh, women don't sell covers. When you put a black woman on the cover, they tank. And so you start getting these like, oh, the romance, the thing, she's not, you know, so mm, it can get mm. a little bit frustrating. But mm. as a diversity advocate, so I do talks on uh, unconscious bias and how our biases um, affect us. And I love the fact that you speak about mm. that as well. But mm. how did you grow up? I mean, you are from Sibukeng and uh, had friends in Sibukeng and I really am curious about your childhood in shaping um, who you are today and I'm sure it will shape you beyond this moment but 
there must have been something with a dad mm. who's an engineer and for black people and a father, I mean, a father who's an engineer and a mom who's a filmmaker. For black people, that's very accomplished. I mean, my mother cleaned um, hospitals and, and my dad was a clerk. Later on, he became uh, an IT specialist, but, you know, it was proper work. Mm. Uh, so what, what was it mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. being you growing up in your family with your siblings? What was that like? So it's actually quite interesting that you mentioned that. So we moved from Sibuking, but the, the, the real part of my childhood was in Lanasia South, which is um, quite a mixed community. And um, growing up as a child, there was, hmm, you grew up with different people of color and you are the only one who looks the way you do. Um, in, in my family, that was very, we grew up in a very big family now, like, my aunts lived with us. My grandmother lived with us. We were just like probably 15 in the household. <laughs> I'm not even joking. Like my cousins, you know. Yeah. Um, and, but interestingly, so you, I, I, it, although I had that background, but also my parents were, my father's an engineer, my mother's a filmmaker, that sort of gives you class privilege that you don't know you have as yet, you know, because it also makes, you know, your parents make you tap into conversations that you would not you know tap into otherwise um or even just see the world and have access to things that you normally wouldn't have because for instance sunscreen was never an issue for me um i'd never you know people will say oh wow your skin looks a b c d yeah it looks this way because my parents were of a certain you know they my father was an engineer he never had to worry about sunscreen he never had to worry about getting me things like monoculars for school not everybody is in that position um and and you're and i'm moving around not actually understanding that my life although i had difficulties in terms of being a young black girl with albinism but there were certain privileges that just came with my parents being you know engineer my my father being an engineer my mother being a filmmaker yeah it's kind of just like certain things you don't have to worry about or you you know um just because of where they were in life and so here i am i'm moving around sort of within worlds um i'm very neutral at home my my sisters my parents all everybody i'm very neutral i'm not i mean i even remember when my mother bought me my mother like was very aluta continua, you know. Um, we love her. Me, I'm gonna buy you black dolls, you know. <laughs> and she said, you know, I, she she made a conscious effort to buy me black dolls, and the black dolls didn't look like me either, you know. So I actually exactly. asked her later. <laughs> I actually asked her later. I said, you know, you used to buy me these black dolls, but they were brown. Did you ever think about that? And she's like. No, but that actually kind of shows you the relationship we had at home. Um, my mother gave me a black doll because she felt like it would signify my experience, but she wasn't looking at it particularly from a, oh, geez, Tanda, this doll might not look like you. Should I paint it? Should I? No, it was the last thing on her mind. So there was a sort of a level of neutrality. And then I move out, of course. Um, there were a whole host of layers, um, layers. You learn certain things about albinism, you learn certain things about race, you know. I remember just in, you know, just in terms of race, you learn the smallest of things. They'll say, oh, your hair, you, you didn't comb your hair, it's untidy, because that day it's curly and it's, you know, and then you have to go straighten it and straight that. So when it's straight, oh, it's tidy. It tells you little things. You get these little nuances that teach you, you know, they make fun of your name. You know, my name is War Tando. Like, oh, oh, Nala Wala Tando. And then you're like, after some time, you try and kind of change your name to suit yes. um, and, you know, English speaking. Yes. Uh, and, and so I was, I was sort of, in terms of race, I was slowly moving into, into understanding what it means to be a young black girl. And then, of course, there's the pronounced um, identity of albinism because it's hyper visible. And yo, that was quite rough because I remember even the first time I heard Libito Lale's wife, I literally looked, I looked, I was like, who's that? Who, who are you talking about? (laughs) Um, Because these, the thing is that the labels come to you, the institutions, the institutions that are like, like some of them are hundreds of years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you don't, when you're four and somebody plugs that institution onto you, that says, this is 
50 or 60 or 100 years worth of load baggage, social baggage. That means something you have no idea. You have, for when it's landing on you at the age of five, that means nothing to you. You just know that it's something that is bad, mm. but, and it's directed at you, and you don't know what it even means. I mean, even I think, I can't even tell you what it means. I can't right. give you I don't you think the, anybody you know? knows, Tando. I don't think anybody I don't like I also don't think anybody quite knows, you know. Um because you know, I guess it's Zulu, it's shower, you know it's a curse. In Gawin is closer, you know, which is a monkey, which is really ironic for black people. Um really ironic. Uh, you know what? As yeah. you say it, I remember hearing it in the hood and I'm just that us as a people who have been labeled we've been labeled since the 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 dawn of human beings discovering class and for us to yeah that is a serious form of self-hatred like it's just it's, it's just the irony you know i kind of i think the irony is that you know well power is corrosive that's the first thing is that you know Black people, and, and, and I think at this point in time in my life, I'm not as restricted as I, as I used to be in my opinions. I think I was far more guarded, but right now I think the fatigue of it all is making me maybe too honest, you know? But power, as long as you have institutions that have a hierarchy, it becomes corrosive. Mm. So when, it, when, it, when you look at something like albinism, black albinism in particular, because it's, it's the funniest thing, it's like whenever you put black on something, there's this load that comes with it. Because if you have albinism and you're Asian and you have albinism and you're white, you don't have the same level of stuff yeah. as black albinism. Because even if you're looking at the murders that happen with regards to albinism, it only happens to black people. Um, but, you know, if... You, we look at, for instance, just the economy of color in the slave trade, um, and you see how people used color as a particular. That's why I say the economy of color, because right. they were they, the they were like you know, exactly. Um, it was it was a form of currency, and they killed people over it. They completely commodified bodies over it, and with albinism, you see the same thing based on color. So within Africa, within the black community, we say black lives matter, right? Yes. And then we have this whole thing going on where people are being dismembered as a commodity based on color. And then you say, but then, okay, let's just clarify. We say black lives matter, are there, is there a, a seg are we segregating which ones matter? Exactly. or not like can we just all have a memo exactly. so that we all understand what we mean by black lives because there is you know with regards to albinism part of the issue is the history of that is that um sure you've got issues of colorism but that's a different issue yeah it's a different issue albinism has a whole load within itself an institution that it's almost raced um it's not a race of course but it's raced because if you if you if you look at the history of albinism albinism people with albinism are some some at the lowest of their caste mm. you know um and when you're having the colorism debate sure you have the issues of light-skinned medium toned dark-skinned then there's even within dark skin there's dark dark skin we know exactly. that when you're quite dark skinned in africa you have highly negative responses uh, um well at least nakona nakona i think it also depends on your on your context it depends where you are in africa which communities you're in but with albinism there's some of that, that trend that goes where people with albinism almost wherever they are are the lowest of their caste mm -hmm. you know um there's a constant pattern of othering mm -hmm. that um creates quite negative consequences because even people say oh you're good luck they're commodifying you they need you for something they have to touch you or whatever because they're trying to oh. get something so it commodifies your your being to say yeah. you're not as human as we are um and so i kind of do feel that if we're honestly talking about issues of racial discrimination because if you're looking at the un racial discrimination is based on race 
it's based on color, it's based on nation. And I, I experience racial discrimination based on color and based on race. Yep. And I can hear us talking about issues that pertain to race, but then you see those patterns still fall within the black community when it comes to albinism. And you think, it's, this is so wild mm -hmm. because it's, if you, you, you have the color of, you know, whatever you, I'd say yes. the institution of whiteness, you know, yeah, you've right. got the color, yes, yes, but yes. completely devoid of the privilege, right? <laughs> in fact, exactly. you are, exactly. <laughs> in fact, you get, you get like, you, you get compounded prejudice yeah. um, and compounded barriers towards it. It's, it's insane. To be honest, I'm actually, I think one of the things that I've really observed, and you'll even notice my, 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 my social media interactions have totally reduced because I look at this and I think the world doesn't make sense to me. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. I know. <laughs> and I can relate because the, 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 the thing about social media, right, and both of us are, are diversity and inclusion mm. um, activists. Mm. And there's a reason mm. why I think that being African, and you speak about this mm. in your um, The Beauty of Inclusion, a talk that you gave at um, the World Economic yes. Forum, your fellow there. And you speak yes. about, so both you and I are African. Mm -hmm. We are women. <laughs> no, <laughs> do you know what I mean? We are black. Mm. But mm, mm. there's a certain camaraderie we have. And then there's an extra layer for you of albanism, which mm. is very, very unique to you. You know what I mean? Mm. So mm. you get with me, mm. with me, mm. with me, and then you get to a stage where there's a, a, a complexity that you have to deal with that I, no matter how uh, evolved I feel, no matter how empathetic I feel, no matter how much I think I'm uh, woke, I, st you, I still mm. understand. And so I wanted to, and then we're mm. going to get your career into modern, but I wanted to talk mm. about the specifically about some of the blind spots that well meaning people sometimes um, overlook. And when I say well meaning, yeah. like well meaning people, I mean people like myself who think that they're. Mm. Right, and it's the same can be said for white people who educate their helpers, uh, children, and say, "Oh my mm. God, she's been a part of this family for twenty five years. I couldn't do anything without her." And yet, mm. there's nobody in their social circles who's of the same class who's black. So mm. they, their mm. well meaningness is lost because actually, there's no mm. in what they're saying. So, I, mm. if people are really serious about understanding, um mm. life is like for you in your being i think it's important for to say for all of us to say we may have overlooked certain things so what are some yes. of the blind spots that we need to be aware of and blind spots are literally like driving something that you look for, say, so, check yourself before you wreck yourself you know what are some of the things that well there are so many. so many um i think you know it's it's quite it's been interesting because i've been distilling um uh a lot of what I'd say are microaggressions. Yeah. Um, but this is the first thing is that um, the word albino is a derogatory word. It's persons with albinism. That's the first thing. The second thing is there's this tendency, um, and I'll, I'll speak in terms of journalism, to give a medical explanation of someone's humanity alongside their story. So it's like, Oh, Tando is a model in a Tando has albinism. Albinism is a genetic disorder. And it's just like, but you're interviewing me about other things. Exactly. And now you have this is not a health article. <laughs> this is a lifestyle yeah. article. <laughs> you know, um, but there's there's that there's that nuanced othering that comes with that to say, oh, she's a condition. It's a condition. It's a you know, it's like that it almost follows you like it's your last name. And see people as people, contextualize. There's a time if I'm going to speak about albinism medically, which I hardly do in my life. Um, but if the context is of a medical nature, then definitely speak about it medically. But also when you speak about it uh, medically, don't speak about it as a disease and a disorder. It's based on what? 
based on what based on what is it a disease based on what is it a disorder the only reason why it's based as a disease or a disorder is because it disrupted the racial binary and we are paying for it exactly. that is the only reason because if you're looking at the history of albinism it the only reason that people had an issue with it as well as vitiligo is because when slave economies were thriving they had these people who they were like black white geez what does this mean what does this mean you know and they said oh abnormal simple but yes the the thing is is that you know what we decide is abnormal is completely culturally constructed the way race is culturally constructed so we decide i was actually trying to explain to somebody the other day i'm like you know when I, when I, I grew up, I grew up having hardly gone to seeing a beach or something like that. And I'd see the sand and the sand was mahogany. And I look at the sand and it's beautiful. It's mahogany sand. Wow. We play around it, you know, repair, repair with the sand. We're doing all of these things as children. We're having fun with this mahogany sand. Then I go to the beach and the sand is white and I love the sand and I'm playing around with the sand. I don't look at the beach sand and say, Hey, but this sand, why is it white? Exactly. Is it abnormal? It's abnormal. Exactly. You don't say that, right? You appreciate that these are two different, you know, um, entities, but you just embrace the fact that they're different. You don't make the difference negative. Exactly. You know, you don't interpret the difference. So you, instead of saying it's a genetic disease, you can say it's a genetic occurrence. It's a biological event. That's a neutral word. Yeah. But to say it's a disease, you make that humanity defective. You almost say it is not supposed to happen. Yeah. So second, just it's not a genetic disorder. It's not a genetic disease. I don't care how which scientists and geneticists, or however they want to term it. Um, they just we're just inheriting a really long history that is twisted. That's really um, it. But that's the second thing. Third. I never really quite appreciated how people constantly um, sort of used, I don't know if I could say status as a way of putting me in order or, 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 or in my place. So sometimes, for instance, and I, 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 I'm just saying, I'm, it's, I don't know, I feel like I'm reaching old age only at the age of 31. No, but I'm, de- I'm feeling that honest now. <laughs> I'll tell you what it is, but, where I am as well. What it is, is that we are living through a pandemic, right? We are yeah. living through a really, really tough time. And we are realizing so many of us have lied to ourselves and each other. Nobody has been mm. honest. We are not honest with our friends, mm. with our families, with our friends. There's so many conversations, Tanda, with my white friends that I sat through. That I think yeah. Oh, that you should yeah. have said something. You should have said something. I, now I know, I know, yeah. Moment. So I am with you. I'm on the bus with you. I've bought the tickets. I'm sitting next to you. Let's tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm actually um I think I, I am at that, even when I have my clients now, um, I take exception to being cens- censored. Um I'll say to them, look. Maybe I have a client in, in, in Europe or I have a client in America or whatever the case may be. I'll say to them, I'll send you what I'm going to talk about in advance. Tell me in terms of the cultural context, if I've got things right or if I'm being offensive, but don't censor me in terms of what I'm going to speak about and that don't tell me, don't talk about race or oh, uh, don't talk about, you don't do that to me. But what I would rather you do is you just say to me, in this particular context, what you're saying is mismatched. Um, because of ABCD, because that's the whole thing about inclusion. And, you know, you have to be able to put a consultative framework to learn about a context you don't know. It's exactly what you're asking me now. You're saying, hey, Tando, we don't know some things. Can you please just teach us because you are in your own body, you know, like, can, can we move into a context where we're willing to learn? So I'm also, I'm at just at that stage where I'm also kind of like, I just want to be honest yeah. um, and not guarded and not worry that there's a threat to that honesty. Yeah. But th- three things, the third thing, um, I don't like it. I don't like the fact that there's some, there's somewhat of a, a nuanced, I'll say, I'll call it a microaggression that comes with um, 
oh, Tando, you're so lucky to be educated. Oh, you're so, you know. And I remember that when I was starting out a lot, not even starting out, this actually happened, just, uh, I think maybe it may, may have stopped in 2018, where I'd come for an interview. And, you know, you would expect that the interviewer or the journalist or whatever, the show, would see me as Tando Hopper, who has, you know, done a whole host of things as a media personality. And they'd say, no, we want to only focus on the challenges and the difficulties of albinism. And you say, yeah, but um, when you were inviting me, I thought we were going to have a broader discussion on things. And then you say, oh, but not everybody's as lucky to be educated as you. Not everybody's as lucky to have a family, a supportive family as you. Not everybody's as lucky to be an international model as you. Believe it or not, I think the last time I actually got that was this year. Oh. And it's almost like always putting you in your place to say, listen, your narrative is one of social exclusion, which is not incorrect. It's true. It's part of the issues that people with albinism experience that I have experienced myself. Your narratives of um, social exclusion, social rejection, but anything outside of that, how dare you imagine your humanity outside of that? How dare you? So there's always that the boxing is also... I don't know how to explain it. It's, it's not just in terms of, you know, um, the issues surrounding albinism, but the things that are ma made to silence you is how lucky you are that you're even educated, yeah. you know? And I, I could never understand that. I could it's never, not. but I got it a lot from the black community. Um, it was, it was a repetitive thing. You know, I've even received things where people say, yeah, you, 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 a whole producer, in fact, I've had very interesting conversations with producers. Producers will say, a producer said, um, you know, Nina Niti, you are oppressed, but you're busy moving around the world, unlike us, the darker ones. And you wonder, where's that coming from? Where is that? Professionals, I'm talking about professionals, you know? So we're not talking about, we always misconstrue the, the issues around the albinism. And we always make it sound like, the only level of prejudice that you are going to experience is prejudice in, you know, in places where people are illiterate with regards to albinism, you know, or places that are, are, are people will always ask about my rural communities and all of that. Yeah. There are issues there. There are. But the thing is, this is layered. This is a very layered problem. Um, so third thing, if I am a lawyer, if I am a president, don't speak to me as if I don't deserve to be that. Exactly. Um, don't speak to me as if I need to apologize for, for any social or economic mobility that I have over my life, especially something like education. Um, Which is a right you have. For, also, also, can I ask Sandra? Do it's a, exactly. It's like the most strange thing. Have yeah? lived experience just because we are educated? I'm telling you. Whether you have loads of money, at the end of the day, you have kinky, mm. you are still black. You do not stop being black because you have money or you have a passport. You do not stop being a person with albinism because, oh my goodness, you are on the cover of Vogue Portugal. You are still black. Black. It's not changed by money, by class. You do not. We are who we are. And I think those things just... And that's why it's my life's work. And I want to teach people to understand how their brains work. Our brains work in yes. organizations. Our brains say to us, your memory, you're pulling from memory. Mm. Memory says to you, black people steal. And that's what you project. But because you know that you have the ability now to wonder yourself. Do you know what I mean? Bam, babe, before you run mm. away with a point that you don't understand. We need to understand mm. Mm. Work so we can actually understand we have the power to respond in a different way. Because if I'd started this interview, yes. let's talk about albinism, you'd be like, oh my God, really? But it's about your childhood, being a lawyer, uh, uh, yes. systems, making your yes. community better, the full breadth of who you are. Yes. We talked about you being a model, but it's about mm. the full complexity of you as a human being and as a spirit. Your spirit decided mm. to get into an African black woman's body who happened to have albinism, but you were a person, mm. a whole entire person. Mm. 
Can we just, mm -hmm. and that's what I think you're trying to do and I'm trying to do, which makes us a little bit like scary because people think we're angry or we're too honest. I know. <laughs> and, and it's like, no. I know. I know. I meditated. I burned some incense. Misha, <laughs> I just want to school you. I want to help you. Yeah, yeah. Right? But actually, to be, and, but to be honest with you is that um, I am feeling tired of schooling people. To be honest, um, I, I feel like, geez, I mean, I started doing this thing with so much vigor in 2012, and now I just feel like, geez, guys, go read, go, go read, ask yourself. As I, I really, I do, I do feel like this is exhausting, you know, um, because it almost feels as though I do understand that we are a consequence of institutions. So we respond to each other. It's like, it's, it's just like when white people are like, teach me. And sometimes black people are like, do you know how tired we are? We don't feel like teaching you right now. You know, go, go read, go educate yourself. And, and then it seems like, you know, but, but snacks. Exactly. But the truth is that my humanity was earned 300,000 years ago when the first homo sapien came. That's when I earned my humanity. When I am born, I'm born into it. I don't have to earn it. It's not something that has to be given to me by anybody. And it's not something that anybody should even dare entertain thinking that they can take away. But I have to live this life as if I have to earn my humanity. I have to explain humanity to you. And it's like, oh, it's an extremely eroding process. Um, it's not, for me, to be honest, I mean, social justice, is sure you know it's, it's not something you really choose um it, <laughs> no. life happens in such a way no. that no, no, no. you do it, not choose it. it just it becomes part of you exactly you don't choose it you don't choose it. and to be honest <laughs> life would be much easier i don't i don't glorify i was actually trying to explain to, to somebody the other time when they were like oh my gosh you know activism is so wonderful and it's so exciting oh, and i said <laughs> it's i don't feel like things because things shouldn't be this way no the thing is we're fighting against a system that shouldn't be this way <laughs> it shouldn't be this way right. we i don't even want to come to the next generation and say you should be activists, and this is exciting. The truth is that you will be an activist. It's not really much of you, a, a choice because the body that you're in is struggling to move. You're struggling to move as a woman. You're struggling, struggling to move as an African. You're struggling to move as... It's not supposed to be this way. We're fighting the system not because activism is supposed to enjoy and it's such a wonderful thing. We're no. fighting it because it's not supposed to be here. It's an... an just system to a point where I'm even getting to, to, to that stage where even the word inclusion feels too soft, yeah. you know, it feels too soft. It feels too much like a negotiation yeah. when you're like, but you know, this is actually a matter of social justice. This is an unjust, unjust system. Exactly. It's unequal, exactly. you know, inclusion. Yeah, inclusion Rokoya, makes, I know what you mean. Inclusion means you need to be given the permission to be included into whatever it is. Whereas justice is the requirement that we really, we need to serve for each other as, as human beings. And I think you are, you've articulated it so well. You don't choose it. Tando, I-, I You don't choose it. I want to be the nicest. The way I was a magazine editor, I want to wear high heels and not look for any feathers and not be honest and say, oh my God, we loved having Tanda on the cover. She's so amazing. I'm free. I want to be that. But it comrade, the activist, has made sure mm. there's certain jobs I don't get mm. because I just want to keep quiet. You know what I mean? And I think that for you, you are at the yeah. end of law. And, yes. and I mean, when I was watching one of your talks, you mentioned something that when we first saw you in 2012 walking for Kert and I was editing True Love magazine at the time mm -hmm. and we were like, mm -hmm. oh, she's gorgeous. But also there's something that you mm -hmm. mentioned that I didn't even pay attention to. You were mascara. You dyed your, yes. you, yeah. your, your brows were black and it made us yes. comfortable, but you didn't feel like yourself. And so, Yes. Now the lawyer comes to meet the model because the lawyer is like, ah, hey, Sissy, <laughs> look like yourself. You don't have eyes like this. And to make that transformative decision with the campaign that you did, I think it was a Fashini campaign, am I right? Was it? Um, Forbes. 
Forbes. Yes, it, it was Forbes started cover. with Forbes. It was a Forbes. It was. It, was a, it actually was a Forbes interview, but then it became a. They 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 used it as a, as a mock-up cover, which, funny enough, the person who was on the real cover of it was Alec Wick, and that actually. So it's funny that that played out in Vogue too. That we had two covers for Vogue. One was Alec Wick, and one was me. So it was quite, it's it quite interesting how that. World going full circle. Look at life. It's amazing. It, um, but yes, it's a very interesting thing that you're, you're bringing up um, because actually I had started dyeing my brows since high school really? and yeah and let me tell you when I dyed my eyebrows um, because I, I would say my high school life was not anything close to the popular kid um, not fun at all not fun at all and had, I put on my brows, I darkened my brows, I darkened my lashes, and then yeah. immediate social turn. Yeah, you're hot. Now. Wow, you look so beautiful, you're so hot, you know? Yeah, and I was like, yeah. I got it, I finally got it. Yeah, um, and I was quite, I mean, it, it gave me a lot of social ease. Yes. Who doesn't want social ease, right? Do so, yeah. Them? Who doesn't want ease? Who doesn't want social ease? Um, and I definitely know that I, I, I could have done with some, a lot of social ease. Yeah. Uh, at the age of 16, when you're beginning to understand your attractiveness or your level of attractiveness, your status tracking, you're looking at the status of attractiveness and you're like, ah, you know, you look at television, you don't see yourself. You'd look at magazines, you don't see yourself. And then you look at who your cousin say is the hot girl. Nothing, n- none of these people are anywhere close yeah. to looking like you. And you know, uh, I, I just think at that point in time, I just had to have something, a look that is more conventional within my community. And it, I got accepted for it. Mm. Um, so it became difficult to let go of the very leverage that was making my life a bit more comfortable. Um, and I had to start asking myself, I'm like, but, you know, um, I, I, my eyebrows are actually pale. My, my, my eyelashes are pale those are usually the biological characteristics of albinism it doesn't happen all the time but usually that's it and when i I, even when i did it i remember i did i did the shoot eyebrows out and whatever and yay as soon as i was done i was like "Ah, i'm back i couldn't even leave you know i couldn't leave that way i was like i'm like i'm sorry i'm not ready i'm not ready i'm not ready like one day at a time you know um and I even remember the first time I, I like, it was always a, an, an experiment. I went to work, I was, you know, while I was still a prosecutor and I took everything uh, out again. And I was like, and I remember my colleague, when he first saw me, he's like, oh, he was like so shocked. He gave me that look like, who are you? You know, like the whole day while we were in court together, I was just like, what's going on? He couldn't say it. Yeah. And you know, that whole, that all of that was making me feel so like, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't be looking like this, you know? And then I would be like, okay, now I'm going to go back. And then I'd go on that color, color, color. And then after that, I'd be like, you know, do, do another shoot. And I'd be like, I'm going to try this again. Like it was a constant yeah. battle, actually. Such a small thing. It was a constant battle. I was like, I'm going to try this again. I'm going to, and then I try it again. Say, no, but sweetie. Your face is gonna disappear. You can't. You can't shoot like this. And you're just like, can I please just shoot like this? You know. <laughs> but it took. So it took. It took a while. And I, it took and a I, while. And I yeah. assume that also uh, working as a model, and you know, people will tell you it's quite editorial. You know, do it because it's for editorial reasons. And I'm sure in my also yeah yeah, yeah. Um, trying to appease and get along, I probably would have said that to you as well. No, Tando, but it looks so beautiful, blah, blah, blah. When the truth mm-hmm. is, it, it is the unscrambling of our own brains that we have to um, figure out. Yes, that is true. So now, funny, it, it's funny that you say that because um, I remember that um, an editor said um, the way I am, we were talking about a, a, a cover. Okay. Um, and I remember that my, 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 my PR was trying to get me into a cover after Vogue, a South African 
cover, um, which I can't mention, of course. <laughs> Of but they said that I don't represent um, I don't represent the target market. The target market was black women. Hmm. Um, very interesting statement. And I thought, but my hair's kinky. Um, I'm like I'm unambiguous you are so about bad. how I choose to call. name also. My God. Eh? Down to your name. You know what? Sorry. My name, my, you know, like my name is Tandor, but I choose to communicate the features that are typically assigned as black. I intentionally communicate those features, by the way. I, I, and I do it not because, I mean, like, I mean, I've had so many hairstyles in my life. It has nothing to do with that. We can, this is, and I always make this very specific point is that this is not about beauty choices because we have to, Geez, we're, we're, we're women. You should be able to put on whatever it is you want. You do whatever it is you want with your body. The, with everything that's been taken away from us, we need to at least be more comfortable having agency over our appearance. Mm. It's not about that. But it's that I made very systemic and structural decisions about my representation. I was like, this is missing in the archives. It's missing for you to see glamour and beauty with regards to black women with albinism having like their afros out and all of that. I need that in the archives. I want that intentionally documented. You can't only see Tando when she's in her afro, just only in difficult circumstances. Right. That cannot be the only thing in the archives. You need to be able to see her in different stories, having that afro. So now you're saying, oh, well, I don't represent the market. And you're like, what does that mean what does what does it mean um I, I just didn't understand it I didn't understand it but yeah so it's, it's, it's been quite a interesting I think media has been probably one of the most interesting and in telling um mediums of prejudice <laughs> I don't have I don't have a softer word right now no 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 that, that's yeah that's why um the media industries is one of the first to die, right? Because if you were like me and you were outspoken, the system washed you out because it was like, that's not what mm. we want you to be nice. We don't mm. want you to ruffle any feathers. Mm. We don't want you to disagree with us. And because you're mm. not activism, <laughs> activism chooses you, you can't keep quiet. Yeah. You're going to lose jobs. Yeah. Like, I cannot keep quiet and I'm trying, <laughs> but I can't. So now, Tanda, before we wrap up, I want to ask you, so now that it's much easier and you're at this place of acceptance, do you find yourself, because we're still women, you're wearing lipstick, we're girls, we're both girls with gaps, by the way. We're both Definitely, women. yes. <laughs> do you find yourself like wearing mascara of another color, like blue? Do you ever find yourself doing those things but understanding that maybe the context with which you do them is different or have you just completely walked away and you are in the space that you are in now i think i fought so hard to get here that i i, I don't angelelli you know it's i think I actually got to a place of choice now because when I was doing the, 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 the mascara, it, I felt coerced by the culture, you yeah. know, by seeing people around me. I felt like the way I look is strange, you know, but now I think if I were to go into and put on mascara, it won't feel like a coercion anymore. It will feel like a choice. It will feel like, yes, I actually just want to spice it up today. I want to do this. I want to, you know, I could even want to, I could decide to put on mascara for the next month. But because I've gone through this process mm -hmm. where I'm like, I'm not going to put on mascara and putting on mascara now is more of agency. It's, it's, it would really, it would have that ease for me, you know, mm -hmm. um, because I'm okay with or without it. It's just exactly what you're saying that with, we put on lipstick, we put on makeup, we put on whatever weaves, we want to dye our hair pink, we want to whatever we want to do, you know, but we just need to get to a point where, because beauty is very coercive. It's yeah. very coercive. The reason why you have only one image sticking out consistently you have like they'll be like okay this is what women are supposed to look like 
the more frequently you see that image, it becomes very coercive. The more you relate to that, to that image, you're like, oh, this is, I'm, everything this is shows me what I am not. So you try to assimilate into being whatever this image is. And you know, it rewards you. When you get there and you say, I'm going to look more like this image, it will reward you. Yeah, like How are you going to stop? Mm. How are you going to even decide what agency is over your appearance? So I think I had to first, this was my own personal journey. I think everybody finds agency in there. Everybody has a journey. Mine was I needed to disinvest in that first and, and go through my process. And I think now, now I can engage with mascara from a place of agency, not yeah. coercion. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the place I think we all have had to go, go through, no matter what it is. You know, you mm. have to decide, if I'm doing it, now I understand why I'm doing it. I'm not doing it because I, people are going to like me or I think it's what mm. I should do. I like the way people look at me, actually. I like this look. You know, mm. I like the way mm. I feel. But then you don't mm. look like yourself. You don't feel like yourself. And so people like you mm. for an imposter. Mm. Whereas now, if you decide to wear it as a costume, you're going somewhere. You know you're going to take it mm. off. You know who's underneath there. You know, even if you don't mm. want to, you're fine. You know, and I think that's mm. what we're trying to help people understand is come to a place of acceptance. Now, I have two questions mm. to ask you. This is probably the most important question I would have asked you. A couple of weeks ago, I happened to speak to um, Sylvester Chauve, whose company has been voted uh, one of the... You know, I think it's one of the 14 most important um, companies on the African continent. And mm. he um, was really candid with me about growing up in Shawelo as mm. a gay uh, uh, boy. Mm. And mm. I asked him how his parents dealt with him because it, his in-laws um, uh, are as wonderful to him as they are to 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 mm. to to him you know what i mean and I, to his husband mm. and i i realized that sylvester's life is a is a little bit like all our lives where you are there to help somebody represent someone mm. and help them feel a connection because one of the things you said in your interviews which is something i believe in is that love and connection are two of the most important things that's why we're here once we mm. learn that we can ascend so Mm. For you, growing up with albinism in predominantly black places, and you know, as people of color, mm. we have our own deep um, issues. What mm -mm -mm -mm. would you do for a young girl or a young boy who's watching you and is romanced by how people look at them because they've decided to play along with everybody else, the way the mascara, the Mm. their best to try and fit into something that's not who they are what is the advice that you would have for them as individuals as young people um in terms of how mm. they feel and what advice do you would you dispense to somebody who's got a child with albinism as particularly when they're black because as you said mm. everything is much much harsher with us is what advice mm. do you have for parents to deal with their children um, and, mm. and help them feel human and not othered and feel valued and feel that their lived experience has the same value as, as anybody else with a visible pigment or more pigment than them. I know it's a lot. From a, a relational level, I would really just say, teach your children enoughness um in every way uh, and i don't even think it's specifically an albinism thing it's just to say you know you are enough you are enough you're smart enough you're pretty enough you're you know um capable enough and in terms of their abilities teach them not yet so whenever they fail just say to them not yet they say i don't feel like, you know, I got a D for maths or whatever, then, you know, you'll say, well, you'll get an A, but you know, you're, you're not yet there, mm. but you'll, you'll get there. They need to believe in their ability to improve, in the ability for life to 
somewhat get better, you know. Um, but I think from a relational level, I would just say just allow kids to have exposure. Because one of the difficulties we have, whether we're talking about just the, I mean, I am not devoid of prejudice. Um, I'm not devoid of stereotyping. No. We, as human beings, uh, in fact, stereotyping is literally encoded in our minds. Um, if you have a brain, but it's just that it's a bias. If you have a brain, you have bias. It's our brains. It's you have a bias, exactly. So we can't, there's no one who is more um, righteous than, than another. Um, unless maybe like you, unless you're born purely genetically very unique. Um, but for, for most of us, stereotyping is something that we all do. It's just that you need to learn how to control it. You need to be able to have a, uh, it's called slow thinking. You need to be able to teach yourself to, to think slow. But one of the things that can help you is exposure. Let your kids see humanity as diverse as it is take them to people who are different engage you know um because then the, the more you see different types of humanity the more you start seeing yourself as also just being part of a of of a humanity that expresses itself diversely you know um but if you don't see different people if you have a child who's got albinism take them, let them see other kids with albinism, let them also see, um, you know, a child who's in a wheelchair, let them see um, your friend who's a trans woman, let them see people, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think that, that that alone will help them feel like the body is their home, you know? Um, instead of feeling like it's a place of attack, you know, they'll feel like this is my body, it's my home. It houses my soul, my spirit, my mind, my blood, my everything. And they'll be able to have a better relationship with it because they can see and appreciate humanity and its diverseness. Um, but you have to walk them through that path. If you can't take them to different people, make them see things like literally cartoons, stories, let them visually see the variation of humanity. So yeah. I don't know if that answers. I hope that answers your question. That, that, uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a great answer. So, yeah, that's, I, I think the, the idea of um, slow thinking of um, you are enough, which I've said many times, mm. and your net not, mm. doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means you're not there now. I think those are three important lessons. So yeah. my last question, and this has been a phenomenal yeah. The lawyer has come to meet the model. The, 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 the <laughs> intersection is clear. You're part of the global <laughs> albinism mm. science. You're one of the founding delegates. Mm. You are a fellow mm. of the World Economic Forum. You mm. uh, interact with the UN, but you are still doing covers mm. and you're still doing the modeling. Mm. I can feel mm. that the reason why you became a lawyer was because you were not just meant to be a model. You were not just meant to mm. be a lawyer, that the two we're going to meet themselves. And I feel like now there's a meeting that is happening. So what's coming mm. for you? Have you thought about as you get more true to yourself and more of an activism and more of a uh, diversity advocate, your mission mm. starts to <laughs> be clear. And so mm. where do you think you want to go? Where do you think you are being led to go? Because you are being called for something and... <laughs> What is that thing? It's a calling. It really is. <laughs> well, thank you uh, for seeing it that way. Um, but, you know, I think at, at this point in my life, I, because I've also seen the contradictions, I don't have a better way of putting it. I've seen the contradictions in humanity. Um, because uh, exactly like race contradictions versus color contradictions versus, you know, and you're looking at this and you're like, but there's one thing about campaigning uh, about it. So we're talking about it right now, which is a form of campaigning for change. But I'm at a point where I just want to create those spaces myself. I want to see if it's possible. So I want to be able to, without re revealing too much about my, my um, 
Saturn return. I guess I'm <laughs> having a second Saturn return, I think, because when I left prosecution, I had one. And now I think I'm having another one where I'm just like, I'm going to just try this thing out. Yeah. But I want to, if I, if I, let's say, move into more storytelling avenues, I want to see if the concept of inclusion, can I create it in my own space without, because, you know, these, these whatever big institutions are, sometimes you have allies. Like, you know, in WEF, I found incredible allies. Sometimes you have allies and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have people who just want to tokenize or who want to do whatever, want to get that quick fix. But all of these spaces can give you so much frustration. And I'm at a point where I'm like, I want to do the test case for myself. I want to be able to say, yo, right. <laughs> I did a music, a wonderful music video. And I had different looking people or whoever's humanity I, 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 I put in front of you. I respected that humanity. First of all, I respected it through representation by you seeing it. And I also um, respected it behind the scenes in terms of how I prepared myself to receive different kinds of people. That means whether it's in the makeup room, whether it's how I negotiate the contract, whether it's how I pay the person, I'm at that stage where I'm like, is it possible? Are we dreaming? Are we dreaming? And if we're not dreaming, then let me try it myself. If we don't see, if we don't walk the talk, if we don't try it ourselves, how will we, how will we know? You say, hey, you look at one big institution, another big institution, you say, you must change, you must change. But then and when you are given any leg up, do you try? Do you try or do you start perpetuating exactly what you're fighting against? You know, do you start following the same rules and keeping to the status quo? Because then you were not really looking for inclusion. You were looking to be included, but you're not looking for inclusion, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, but it's, it's true. And I think right now I'm trying to learn as difficult and as scary as the stuff I want to do is, I'm trying to see if I can create those platforms realistically. Then I can come back and do a TED talk about it and say, guys, <laughs> look, look, this is, and I'm not saying that those places don't exist, but I'm saying the people who created those spaces are my, my tribe. They are all over the world. They are my tribe. And I'm like, yes, in, instead of asking these places to constantly change, because that's, for me, I've, I'm, I'm tired now, you know? I'm like, I actually just want to see, I want to see that woman with albinism act in a way where she's just, you know, I said one, 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 one thing I, I said to, um, and this happens with a lot of underrepresented people almost everywhere across the world. I said to a friend of mine, I haven't seen us loved on screen. And he asked me, what do you mean? I'm like, I haven't seen a person with albinism not have a whole host of things, just she is the pretty girl who's loved on screen. She's the person who the guy wants to uh, date, marry, and it's done. They go through this whatever issue they have, you know, like a normal rom-com or whatever. They just move through screen and just be somebody who is worthy of love, just in terms of culture communicating this. And whether the person has albinism, whether it is a woman in a wheelchair, whether it is a man who is blind, whatever the case may be. And you see the LGBTQI plus community fights for that. Yes. They fight for it. They fight for you to see, to see, to commute, for them to say, this is how we are deserving of love. What we do is love. We're deserving of it. And we're going to show it to you. We don't always have to see them in ways that are caricatured or, you know, and you also see within the black community in the United States, they fought to show themselves as being people who can be loved on screen, exactly. being people who can be in powerful positions that are portrayed in a way where power is not like corrosive and ugly, not gangsters, not like, you can't do that all the time. There's a place for that. It's been in the archives, it's been documented. Shop. Now can we move into other stories too? It's really just that that's the question. So, and they fought for it. You can see representation in terms of you, your Black Panthers, your whatever. They are fighting yeah. to say our humanity on screen, we need to do right by it. But I'm also saying, is it possible to just do right by more than one looking, you know, one kind of looking person? Um, so I, that's where I am now. I'm going to take a little bit of a pause. 
and I'm going to find my, my way in storytelling where I can see if I can do a test case for myself and say, when you're working in this space, can we build this world together? Is it possible? You know, um, yeah. I speak life on your blessings. I, um, what you're talking about reminds Thank me you. that Maya Angelou said, uh, not Maya Angelou, excuse me, Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison said, if there's a book that you want written and you haven't found it, you have to write it yourself. And that's what yeah. <laughs> you know. You have to write it yourself. I'm there. Exactly. You I think to, I'm really there. Yeah. Because you, know, you, you don't see it, right? And if you want to wait for somebody else to show it to you. Yeah. You the end of time. What I would tell yeah. you, Andor, um, as somebody who's nine years um, older than you, is that you, when you get to 40, are going to mm. be even better than you think because you're arriving at that destination 10 years earlier than I arrived, you know, and anybody who gets there earlier, they include other people, Mm. they they move us forward. And so your Saturn return is going to be more than glorious, more than glorious because you were put here to do exactly this. And it's not going to be easy. Like, that's why I started Relevant. I was like, even if five people listen, mm. but I want to have these conversations that I can't have normally mm. because it's too serious mm. or, you know what I mean? Whatever the mm. case, you don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about it. And so yes, if I get yes. one person who works yes. and they pass it on to other people, then I'm doing the right thing. And I'm going to continue doing it Yes, such time that numbers don't matter all numbers yes uh, yes two is just the fulfillment because this thing has haunted me and called me and now yeah because i'm honoring it and thank you for honoring your gifts we please know that i'll be cheering in the background (laughs) wearing the social justice t-shirt saying yes (laughs) (laughs) from reading videos to Bless us, write, Tando, show us, represent us, <laughs> like, and represent yourself. And thank you so much for being you. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for your life. Thank you for validating so many people who have felt unseen. You are really a daughter in whom God is pleased. Continue meditating, continue fighting for us. I'm on the team. If you need anything for anything, a talk, uh, let's go tackle this thing together. I'm there. Thank you, Tanda. This was amazing and transformative. Likewise, likewise, likewise. Likewise. Um, I really mean that. If you, if you really do need anything, um, I think solidarity is always far more powerful than support. Because um, support is something you can withdraw, but solidarity is like we are in this thing together, you know. Um, and also thank you for having me beautiful things about platforms like these is they <laughs> literally like make it they, they put you on like loudspeaker you know um, because it's one thing when you're talking and you're talking and you're talking but you know platforms like yours they say you know sis I'm actually gonna give you loud for loudspeak yeah. like because then it spreads across and um, cause it's a story, you're a storyteller. So you give a storytelling avenue. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you, Tandu. Thank you. Like, may you be abundantly blessed. Um, may you exceed even your own expectations and may your life be even brighter than you think or hope it will be. Be blessed. Thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye, bye. bye.